Hi everyone, it's Catherine from Cloudberry Flowers. Welcome back and Happy New Year. Now it's 2024. It has been a really cold night overnight. It's been minus seven degrees Celsius. So it's a hard frost in the garden and I'm not gonna be out here managing to do much weeding today. Got a little bit done last week for the first time when the ground was slightly less solid. So that was exciting to just get back out in the fresh air and get in the garden and get it started for this year's growing. I've got my seedlings that I've got from autumn sowing tucked up inside at the moment because it's so cold. Mistake from last year was keeping them in the greenhouse um, and it just got so cold in there last year that they didn't survive. So I've actually got some tucked up in the house now to see if we can keep them going till the springtime. And when it's a little bit warmer, they can go back out in the greenhouse again. So I thought for first video of this year we would have a look back at the last one because it's always really good to go back through any diaries you've got any journals you've been keeping any photographs and just work out when you sowed things when they flowered what flowered well what didn't work out so well and then you can make a new plan for the coming year and so that's what I've been doing over the last couple of weeks and will continue to do so haven't started any seed sowing yet I'm holding off there trying really hard not to get too carried away and just wait for those crucial 10 hours of daylight to get my seeds sowing in February time. So let's go just now, have a look back at last year. So January is probably the quietest month of the year for me. Um, I was still selling some things on the stall last year. So I had for some hyacinth pot and I had some Narcissi paper whites as well in baskets that I was selling. But it was largely a time to look back, start planning my sewing schedule, make sure that I had my seeds ordered if I needed any top ups and get some fresh compost in so that when February came, I was able to get going without any delays on the seed sewing then. Did get a bit of snow in January and lots of frosty ground and things. So when you're not working outside, it's quite a nice chance to go and have a look in some of those books that you've got on the garden and things and time to read and take time with that. February still the ground is quite unworkable, the soil is frozen solid still a lot last year and um, really nice to see the snowdrops coming out in the garden though that's always just the first signs of spring coming and with that crucial 10 hours of daylight that was time to start seed sowing and I was really good last year that I didn't sow before then. So an easy way to remember when you're going to be getting your 10 hours of daylight is to think of Valentine's Day because it's always around about mid-February so that's always in the back of my mind about when it's a good time to start. And I sowed all sorts of seeds then, more hardy annuals at that time, some perennial seeds as well, some sweet peas were getting going. In February I'd be using my heated propagating bench, having some humidity domes over the top of the seeds until they germinated, then lift them off. Then once they're getting established, prick them out like this and pop them in the greenhouse. February I do watch the weather forecast like a hawk. I need to be making sure that if it is going to be a night where it dips below freezing, I just lay some horticultural fleece over the top of the seedlings to keep them nice and healthy overnight and then lift it in the daytime. So going into March last year, it's still very cold, but we were getting more daylight and we were having days where I could work with the soil, start clearing beds a bit, getting some paths laid and you can start to see the tulips emerging from the soil and things, which is exciting, but still lots of frosty days as well. So any hardy annuals that I had planted out because March I start to get them out, I would cover them overnight in horticultural fleece and then left that off in the daytime. So you can just see down that bed on the left there, you can see all those tulips coming through. So that's the sign of all that hard work in the autumn. Great to see them. And then you start to get all the hellebores coming through as well. And these just are fantastic flowers. One of my favorite spring flowers. Great for our floristry work and for using in weddings. But at this initial stage, when they come through in March, they are too immature for cutting. So I see this as the time for me to enjoy them when they're in the garden and you have to wait until those seed pods start to mature and start to form before the flowers can be cut. Otherwise they're just going to wilt. It doesn't matter how much you condition them, if you cut them early they are not going to be upright for you. So you just need to wait until later in April, beginning of May, when they will be nice and mature for cutting. 
So as well as the hellebores, it was exciting to see some hyacinths coming into flower in March last year. And this was really helpful because Mother's Day was really early last year and I didn't have a huge amount of flowering. But I was able to have some nice pots on the stall full of hyacinths and early narcissi that I had grown. But it really wasn't warming up in March. Towards the end of March, we were still getting some really heavy frost. And you can see here on the tulips that they are getting quite a lot of frost on them. Luckily in March, none of these tulips here had any buds on them at the stages, just the leafy growth. And they can cope with some frost like this. I didn't need to cover them. Um, but other things that I'd started to do was planting out my hardy annuals in March. And they can tolerate a little bit of cold, especially if you've hardened them off well. But just to be on the safe side, I was covering them with some fleece and caterpillar tunnels at night just to protect them and then lift off in the day. So by April last year, I was definitely ready for some sunshine and I think a lot of people were. It felt like March had been another cool month and we had lots of frosts and things. And then going into April, there just did start to be some sunny days. Not many, but a few. And with a little bit of warmth too, that was enough to bring the narcissi on. And I'd spent a lot of time planting out narcissi back into the grass. I'd been taking it out of the flower patches because I didn't feel like that was working so well. So I wanted to make a bit of a change and that actually was really successful last year at the Narcissi were lovely at the bottom of the garden and I was also able to start making some more jars for the stall and things as well we started to get a few more different flowers out so we were able to have some fritillaria some muscari more hyacinths some lovely foliage to work with the odd anemone was coming out as well so I love that time of year when you get to start with a right mix of flowers that you can work with again Mid-April we started to get the first tulips. It's always really exciting to see the tulips coming up after months of hard work where you've been planting them and looking after them over the winter time and start to use them in arrangements and in some wraps for the stall as well. And the tulips really were, at the start of the season, they were absolutely fantastic. I'd grown lots of different ones. We'd had some doubles, some fringed, all sorts of different varieties, some brighter ones, some paler ones. And here you can see lots of tulips that are wrapped in newspaper and cut ready to go off to the florist. And I wrap them in the newspaper just to keep the stems nice and upright. Tulips like to bend towards the light, so if you wrap them in newspaper, then that just helps to keep the stems nice and straight and sturdy for using in arrangements. So I always find April a really exciting month because it is really lovely to be able to work with tulips again and narcissi and muscari and fritillaria. So many different flowers coming out in the garden. They're scented and there's just so many different combinations you can make when making up flower arrangements. It just gets you all excited about the growing season again. But towards the end of April, the frost hadn't gone away. We still were getting some really low overnight temperatures. So I was having to cover the tulips at that stage in fleece overnight because the buds were out and I didn't want them to spoil and not be able to be used. And April, such a busy month in the greenhouse as well. Lots and lots of seed sowing going on. So you're still succession sowing hardy annuals. You are starting off more tender things as well. Sowing cosmos seeds, things like that. And you're also starting to harden off lots of your hardy annuals. So you're constantly having things going in and out the greenhouse and you're planting out as well. So I think April last year was one of my busiest months because you are cutting tulips constantly. They come out throughout the day so you can be harvesting three, four, five times a day. You are prepping them, conditioning them for florists, getting them ready. You are using them in arrangements, so doing lots of arranging. And at the same time, you're sowing lots of seeds, you're hardening lots of things off, you're planting things out in the garden, you're fleecing things at night if the temperature is dipped down. So lots and lots of flower growing and gardening getting done that month. May starts to be an exciting month in the greenhouse because that's when I was starting to see a lot of more tender annuals that were starting to germinate and grow into little seedlings like the cosmos. Here you can't start them off too early so I've never started them off in February and March. I'd always start to sow them in April time, bring them on in May before planting them out at the very end of May, beginning of June. 
other things were coming on in the greenhouse, snapdragons, they can be quite slow for me to really get going so it was nice to see these just starting to put on some growth and then we started to have other things like Cerinthi. I was late doing these because I lost a lot of the ones I was trying to overwinter in the very cold temperatures last year so I was putting on later batches and um, we got some really nice stems out of them later in the year. Other things that were starting to come on were things like my Larkspur. Again, I'd lost a lot of these over the winter, so I was starting off late by doing some sowings in March for these, and they were just starting to come and get going now. Didn't have great Larkspur flowers last year, maybe because these ones were so late at getting started, so hopefully get some better Larkspur this year. I was starting to do some late sowings of hardy annuals so these were all ones that were done in March and they're really starting to put on good growth in May in the greenhouse so they were getting hardened off and starting to be put outside in the daytime and brought inside ready for planting out. Cornflowers are a good one to succession so because after a few weeks of having the flowers you start to find that they tail off and the flowers do come but you're not getting such usable stems for arrangements or florist do work then so it's good just to have fresh batches coming through by six sessions so in every few weeks up until about May early June time. I really love scabious and had lots of lovely plants coming through here but actually in the end I wish I'd planted more because I had some lovely flowers last year but I could have done with more so increased volume on scabious sowing I think this year will be needed. My best Ami flowers come from autumn sowings that I can get through the winter. They make magnificent tall plants with loads of big flower heads on them. But I lost them all in the freeze in December last year. So these were later sowings that I was trying to bring on. And I did have some nice Ami last year but they were not nearly as good in size and number of flowering stems as the ones that are autumn sown the year before. This is a succession sowing batch of grasses that I did. So I'd be sowing them every few weeks last year. And so these were sown in April time and they have got good growth on them by May. Be ready to plant out soon. And they really added so much to my arrangements last year. They were really successful where the grass is. End of April, beginning of May is a good time for me to get my sunflowers going and keep doing succession batches of them every few weeks so that I get some lovely flowers later in the summer. Dahlias as well, this is the time that they would be all growing away. They get potted up in late March, April time, kept away from the frost, fleece over them if need be in the greenhouse and then start to get hardened off in late May for planting out early June. So just so much going on in May in the greenhouse. You can see here that there were just so many trays of seeds that were growing away into nice little seedlings there needing pricked out and potted on and lots of batches so that you continuously got new flowers coming through throughout the season. So May was a very busy time in the greenhouse but it was also hugely busy outside in the garden. The narcissi were really coming into their own. The beginning of May they were absolutely fantastic. Lots of scented narcissi to go all with these wonderful tulips that were just popping every day. So really you were starting to get the first tulips mid-April and they were going right the way through to mid-May, late May. And also I think because we have cooler weather here in the spring's time it doesn't really get going until late May. That really does just keep the tulips going going that little bit longer. I think if we were to get a heat wave in late April, early May, then that would get rid of the tulips much more quickly. But they were able to keep going for quite a few weeks. Unfortunately, towards the end of May, started to get some tulip fire in some of the tulips that were coming through then. The first lots were absolutely fine, but then just towards the end of the season, I noticed that a bed had tulip fire and we did lose some there. But despite a uh, bit of tulip fire towards the end of the season in one of my beds and losing quite a few. I had so many absolutely wonderful tulips last year. They were absolutely fantastic and I really enjoyed cutting them for florists to use locally and also having a few that I was able to wrap for the stall and my customers that like to pop by there as well. And it's really nice to use so many different varieties of tulips and arrangements. You're spoilt for choice and you can see here that we've got lots of lovely ones. There's some nice pink ones in there, white fringed ones mixed in with scented narcissi and we've got honesty, 
raspberry leaves for foliage. There's just so many beautiful things that you can put into arrangements. You can add in some fritillaria as well, some snowberry foliage, some hellebores, some hyacinths if you've still got them going in May. You really start to get an abundance of different material to work with and I find that really exciting. And as you get through May and you get towards the end of it, you may be lucky to still have some tulips going, but things start to transition in the Cloudbreak Flowers Garden for me then. And last year, that's when you start to see things like the white broom coming through, which is something that's really nice. I planted that a couple of years ago and it's starting to really grow now. You get so many other nice foliages to use as well. Raspberry leaf foliage is absolutely fantastic. I really like using that. It's nice and sturdy at that time of year and snowberry foliage as well. It's just such a vivid green colour and as long as you condition it really well then that'll hold up well in water too. Raven's wing, you can just start to see the flowers coming out now on that lovely ferny foliage. That's one of my must-have flowers that I like to use in arrangements. And this spirea bridal wreath, lovely foliage and when it comes out in flowers it's absolutely gorgeous. Use so much of that in wedding bouquets over the years. So that end of May time is a transition. You can see here that on the edges of the flower patches we've got the narcissi, we're starting to die back there. But we're starting to get growth and even a few corn flowers on those first plants there. So lots of things were planted out already by this time. You can see papillarium there and some grasses and things. And in early May, the weather is still very cool. There wasn't much sunshine and things can kind of come to a bit of a standstill. If you planted things out in late March, April, sometimes if you don't get the weather in Scotland, you can just think, oh, they're just not doing anything at all. They're not going to grow. But actually, by the end of May, we started to get a little bit of heat coming in. It was starting to get very hot and it was starting to bring on some growth on to these plants. And the main thing I was having to do then was when we started to go into that little bit of a heat wave we got last year in Scotland in late May, early June, I was having to do lots of watering to make sure that these all grew nicely and had enough moisture to get down to their roots. So these are the sweet peas that I was starting to put out some corn flowers there as well. It's always amazing, they do look like they're not going to do anything and then just all of a sudden over a few weeks they really get going. One of the things that I also do a little bit of is netting over some caterpillar tunnel tubes just when I put them out to get them established because I have pigeons that like to go in and they like to destroy and peck at um, the new seedlings so I just protect them for a few weeks until they're more established. The things that really get growing well first are the things that have been overwintered. So these are the earlier that I got through the winter last year and they really start to put on growth fairly quickly by the end of May. You know it's not going to be that long until you start to see some flowers there. And the earlier was really very successful here last year. Also got the corn cockles starting to put on growth as well. They had been a little bit slower to get away but started to come back again there at late May time. Overwintered Phacelia, it was really starting to grow away at the end of May and this was a fantastic flower for me last year. I really recommend growing some Phacelia if you haven't tried it already. And I have got a video on how to grow Phacelia if you want to find a little bit more about it. So by the end of the May it was getting hot, far too hot in the greenhouse to keep things in and they need to be getting hardened off and used to being outside. So these are some pinched out cosmos that I had outside in the daytime in a nice shady bit outside of the direct sunlight that we were starting to get and I also had the dahlias outside hardening off as well and um, these certainly needed to get into the ground that first week in June because we started to get a heat wave and I didn't think that we were going to get any frosts after that. The dahlias really were magnificent last year and they were so successful I found that I was cutting them all the time for florists and actually found that I didn't really take very many pictures of them or any video footage because I was just so busy cutting them that I forgot to do that so I'll have to make sure this year that I get some better footage of the dahlias. One of my favourite places to wander in May is the top flower patch because this is what I've transitioned over to perennials over the last few years and May is when it just starts to come back to life again. It can look like there's not much happening there till you get to May and then it just is a riot of colour. It's just so beautiful. So I can enjoy it as a perennial garden but I also do use it a lot for cutting from as well. There's so many lovely things that you can cut from from perennials so they're definitely worth establishing as well as your hardy annual sowing from seed every year. 
I think what I love about May as well in the perennial flower garden is the colours. I just love the pinks and the blues and the whites together. They just look so pretty. And just towards the end of May, you start to get the first alliums coming through. Aqualegia as well. Very pretty. And one of my favourites is Ranunculus Floropleno. So it just comes out for a few weeks, end of May, and it's beautiful in arrangements. And lovely sweet smelling Hesperus as well. So, so many lovely flowers to cut for florists out of that perennial garden. So here you can just see how successful it is to grow some lovely perennials for using. And although I was cutting a lot for florists in May, I was also cutting for local customers as well and making up some nice wraps with some alliums and perennials in there too that I could pop on the stall. And lots of orders for nice flower jars with mixes of alliums and ranunculus. You can see there the ranunculus starting to come through. So I don't know if you remember, but I lost all my ranunculus and my enemies, or the majority of them anyway, in the big freeze that we had in December 2022. And then I wasn't going to grow anymore, and then I got tempted and I bought some corms, not too many, but I bought some and started them off in February 2023. And I didn't know whether it was going to work or not. I didn't know whether they were going to flower well. But really luckily, they came out really beautifully. And I had some lovely ranunculus at the end of May and into June last year. So lots of lovely, lovely flowers going out for florists at that tail end of May last year. Ranunculus floropleno and the perennial cornflowers you can see there. And the raven's wing, Hesperus. Aqualasia, lots and lots of beautiful flowers. And then these were the last jars for May last year, just showing you those nice perennial flowers and nice foliage in them as well. So the first part of June ended up being really hot and sunny which was great after such a cool spring where it just felt like that was going on forever and we weren't ever going to get some nice warm sunny weather. But with this hot weather came quite a bit of a drought and there was a lot of watering needed in those first few weeks of June. Did manage to get all the dahlias out though, that was great, you can see them there on the left hand side individually staked and planted out there. And then we started to get the first flowers coming out from those hardy annuals. So you can see Saponaria there on the left was coming out. We had our Lea and Salvia there in the middle. And then the cornflowers started to come out as well in the heat and the sunshine. So a lot of growth was put on with all our plants. And we started to get a bit of transition again in the flower patch with all the alliums starting to come out too. So I grow a lot of purple sensation and purple rain alliums and I do this because they're just a nice size, they're not too large and they work really well in bouquets and in the larger jar arrangements as well. And I really like their colour, this vivid purple goes really well with other perennials and flowers that are out in that time of year. So things like the Hesperus which is white is still going and then you've got white Orlea that goes really nicely. You've got pinks from your lupins that you can use and you start to get some phacelia which is light purple which goes alongside it really nicely as well. Blue from those perennial cornflowers and some irises as well so lots of nice colours that go really well together. So the start of June really was great for being able to cut for a florist because there was just an abundance of different flowers coming out in that nice warm weather that I could provide for them. And there were plenty orders that were coming in for jar arrangements as well and I had lots of fun making these up with so many different combinations of flowers and here's some of my favourite combination of colours, purples and whites and blues together. And then we were still getting ranunculus and irises were coming out as well. Here in Scotland I think we're really lucky that the ranunculus will keep going well into June for me because we don't get the heat that other countries might or even the south of England get. It's always just cool enough that the ranunculus are quite happy to keep flowering. If they are in intense heat then they do tend to, to stop flowering. And even though we were having a bit of a heat wave in June at the beginning, it was still not the temperatures that people were seeing down in the south of England. So we've got lots of lupins coming out in the garden at this time of year as well and some lovely gladioli too and the first of the phacelia which was flowering in the garden which was really nice to see. 
Cecilia really was very successful last year. I got some really good long thick stems of Facelia and they were really good as a succession sewing as well. Irises were coming out uh, very quickly. You have to be like the tulips where you're harvesting all the time. Irises can really pop in the summer sunshine as well. So you need to be quite quick at getting them harvested. And um, they kept going for a good couple of weeks, providing lots of nice flowers for the stall and florists. I really like irises. They're really easy to grow and I really love the flowers as well. They're really beautiful. They don't have a hugely long fast life compared to some of the summer annuals, but they will last a good few days, best part of a week in a vase. So one thing I did last year was take lots and lots of pictures of all the flowers that were going out in my floristry buckets, but not quite so many of what I was actually doing in the garden. So this year I need to make sure that I'm taking lots of photographs out there on the flower patch just as much as the arrangements and the cut flowers themselves. This was one of my favourite arrangements from June. Just love the colours and all the different flowers there. And you can see that lovely light rose corn cockle there in the centre. And I really enjoyed growing them last year. I think that the darker purple ones, I'd kind of just not enjoy growing them so much in the last couple of years because they weren't so usable. They were quite a strong colour that didn't necessarily mix that well with things. But the white varieties and the light rose varieties are just absolutely fabulous to use in arrangements or in wedding work. And here's a nice bouquet showing those fabulous June flowers with irises and some peonies and ranunculus, naringium and saponaria in them. Such a lovely mix of flowers to work with. I love growing grasses last year and using them in arrangements and you can see them here in this one and they just add so much texture and movement and are just really that little bit unique. If you're going to give somebody a jar arrangement with these in them then it's something nice for them to look at and say oh what's that that's a little bit different I haven't seen that before. Last June one of my top favourite cut flowers came out and that was nigella. You really can't beat nigella and I've got a video on how to grow that which you can have a look at on my channel. Just search for how to grow nigella and you should find it there under those individual series of flower videos. The month of June is always the last few weeks of term at school and that is always the time that Children like to give their teachers something to say thank you with and there's nothing nicer than being able to make up some jam jar posies of locally grown flowers and full of sweet peas for scent for them to give their teachers. So I really enjoy doing that in June as well. June last year saw the start of the salvia really coming into its own. It had just started to flower a little bit in May but it kind of grew in maturity and depth of colour in June and more usable stems then. <clears throat> they were absolutely fantastic. So if you want to find out more about growing salvia as an annual then please do look at that individual series again because there's a video on that there as well. This is one I want to do a video on this year if I can, which is Saponaria, which I really love to grow as well. It's got fantastic branching stems that you can use in flower arranging. So I hope just going back through some of the footage from my flowers last year has given you some inspiration about trying to grow things that you've maybe not tried before. There's some fever few there. We've got Strantia, some Canterbury Bells some yarrow. So so many different flowers you can grow and this is the time of year for deciding what you want to try. You can't grow everything so you have to narrow it down to what it is that you want to have a go at this year. What would be interesting to share in the comments section is what were your most successful and least successful flowers from last year. That's sometimes a good starting point as to what you're going to grow this year. So my least successful flowers last year were probably my larkspur. I didn't have nearly as much of that as I would have liked. And anything that did come was on very short stems with not very many flowers. And also my zinnias really didn't work out last year. And I have tried them quite a few seasons now and I'm just not getting very far with growing zinnias. And I think that that is probably because they're just not suited to the climate and my garden here in Scotland. 
However, I would love to hear from you if you are a zinnia grower, you've had some success and you do live in either Zone 8B or in um, Scotland here. It would be really interesting to know if people do have success with this. So going away in the summer holidays is always a bit of a thought because you don't know what you're going to come back to after you've left the flower patches for a couple of weeks. But we did go away in the beginning of July and then when we came back mid-July time I was pleasantly surprised to see that the flowers were actually doing okay. And I think the reason for that was because the weather had not been good while we had been away. It had been wet and cool and that heat wave in June had disappeared and some really quite cool weather was setting in for the rest of the summer with a lot of rain um, and this had actually suited the flowers well it meant that they weren't getting dried out and um, they were getting enough water while I was away and it also meant that there hadn't really been any wild wind at that point so there wasn't any damaged stems so I was able to come back from holiday, get straight back into cutting for florists again. And it was really nice because I was able to see that there had been a bit of transition again. We'd kind of come out of that first stage of alliums and irises and things in June. And now I was starting to get the first dahlias. And I was starting to get other perennials coming through like astrantia and yarrow as well and eryngium. So lots of new flowers to be working with. And the weather, although it was cool and there wasn't a huge amount of sunshine and it was wet, some things like the dahlias just did really well last year. And that salvia and the status and things, it just seemed to suit them. So going into August, you can see the status here just had rows and rows of it. It was just really fantastic and I just love the colours of status as well. And it's brilliant because you can dry it so you're not having to necessarily use all the stems as fresh ones immediately. You can store some for later use in the season, which is really good. August is always the last month in the flower season where I know that I'm going to get a full month of flowers. You never quite know when you're getting to September time. So I was really enjoying working with the flowers at this time. It's the time of year when the girls go back to school so you have a little bit more time. Although I had at this point started um, working back in the hospital. So this is when things really started to change for me. I was no longer doing private studying at home for retraining. I was now actually away a few days a week and that was taking me away from the flower patch so it was just the start of a transition time for me how could I manage both the flower growing the arranging and also being in hospital a few days a week working but it was okay it was manageable and I am going to learn a lot more about that this year August was a time when some new flowers were coming into their own so the scabious really started to do really well this time of year and I can never have too much scabious. I always think I've grown enough and then it comes round to August, September time and I think oh I wish I had grown a few more plants so I think this year I'm going to make more of an effort to grow even more scabious because I do just love it. Cosmos did much better for me again last year. So 2022, I'd had a year for the first time where it hadn't done so well, which really surprised me because usually it's very reliable. But last year it was back looking brilliant again. You can see here we've got some Daydream and some Apricotta and just love those ones. And I would like to try some new varieties this year if I can. So that's going to be one of my new things to do. Choose some new Cosmos varieties to try. So you get a few dahlias coming out in July and you can see that that is the start of the season for them but it's when you get to August and September time that they just really keep producing blooms and I've learned over the years to cut much deeper into my dahlia plants to get longer stems but also to encourage future blooms as well. The more that you can cut into the plant and be quite brave about it the better the flowers are that you're going to get um, in the coming weeks afterwards. One of my big successes from last year was annual asters. And I've tried growing them before, but I've always found that the petals seem to get damaged from the weather outside, and maybe from insects as well, and they just didn't grow particularly well for me. But last year, they really did. They were fantastic last year. And what I did was I experimented this year by covering the flower buds just before they were opening out fully with the same organza bags that I was using for the dahlias. And this really worked. It did protect them, and I got 
blooms that were perfect that I could cut for a florist. So I'm going to do that again next year. But I just love those apricot coloured ones. They were fantastic. So if you look down into the flower patch there, you can see all the organza bags there on the dahlias. And that has just been a game changer for me, protecting those precious buds when they're just starting to unfurl and you just get amazing dahlia flowers that are not damaged um, when you do that because earwigs and slugs and things like that they have been a problem to me in the past and that has definitely helped. I enjoy growing the Procut series of sunflowers every year, so I do Procut Orange, but this is also Procut White Night, and I just think it's a beautiful sunflower to try growing. So running a small business, I've had to decide over the years how I'm going to sell my flowers. And it all started off 10 years ago with me growing my flowers and arranging them in jam jar posies for my garden gate stall. And then times changed and I very much started to grow flowers and arrange them for weddings. So I did that for a good number of years. And then as I started to look into going back into healthcare as well, which was a job that I really loved, I knew that I'd have to adapt cloudberry flowers again. I wasn't going to be in the garden growing things in the flower patch and being able to arrange every day. So I knew that retail bouquets and things like that, I could maybe do one or two days a week, but I certainly couldn't be doing them seven days and offering that. And I knew that I also couldn't be offering the wedding flower service that I was doing before as well. So last year I started to adapt and I grew a lot more flowers for florists. And this was very successful and I really enjoyed it. So a lot of my flowers were going to florists, but at the same time, I didn't want to give up the arranging side of things completely because I really enjoyed that part of my business. It was something that I taught myself. It's definitely not by the book how I arrange flowers. It's something that I just put combinations together that I feel work, but it's something I really do enjoy and the garden gate stalls where it all began. So I'd really like to keep it going. But I have definitely noticed a decline in sales in the last couple of years since COVID and with the cost of living and people don't have as much disposable income as they did. So sales have definitely dropped. So last year I did have a bit of a think about whether I keep it going or not and I decided that I would keep it open and I'm glad I did because I still do get some regular customers that are coming past for their flowers. There were still some new ones coming by which was good as it's not an area of town that um, you go to unless you know it's there. It's a very quiet area, so there's no passing trade. Um, so going forward this year, Garden Gate Stall is definitely going to stay because I do love making my jars up and I just really like that idea of having an honesty stall and being able to pick up fresh flowers and something that's locally grown and um, it's just something a little bit different. I like it when I go on holiday or um, I'm out and about in the car and you see little roadside stands and they may be selling fresh eggs or vegetables or local honey or cakes and things. I always think that they're, they're lovely and um, it's nice to support them as well. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna keep the garden gate stall open. We're gonna keep providing flowers for florists locally. And I'm also going to have to work out when I can offer flowers to order. So if people order, I'm going to have to have a couple of days in the week when I can deliver them. Um, but the other days when I'm working in hospital, um, I'll have to be closed on those days. So lots to work out going forwards. So September time, I started to get some Crespedia out. That was something that I was just trying for fun this year, something new to grow. Have you ever tried growing Crespedia? The yellow balls are just so much fun. They're really interesting, something different to grow. And September time, it was busy beginning of the month, but then as the month wore on, we started to get more stormy weather, lots of wind, lots of rain. It was cooler, not any really hard frost to take the flower patch out and the dahlias were still going. But by the end of the month, the quality on the petals was starting to deteriorate and it did look like there were signs that it might be an earlier finish um, than usual for the flower patch.
So this was October. This was the very last few flowers that I was able to get out of the flower patch this year um, and then we had to call it a day. Um, so actually that was the first time I think that it has been the wind and the rain damage that has stopped the season rather than a hard frost which is usually what happens. Usually we have one hard frost and it takes a daily us out overnight and that's a, a signal for the end of the season but this year it was. It was more the, the rain and the wind. Um, so early October that, that was the end of the season for this year but it did give me the opportunity to tidy up earlier and um, we waited for the frost to lift the dahlias but you could get the beds cleared and so that was it we didn't get into November with our flowers this year but it has been lovely today to look back at all the footage and the pictures from last year's flowers and get some inspiration and um, for what we're going to do this year and it just makes you excited for the growing season ahead so thanks very much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed going back through last year, looking at it with me. And um, it's definitely made me think about doing things slightly differently, especially now that I'm combining flower growing with another job as well. And so this year is going to be really interesting for me to find a balance and find out um, whether it's been worth not growing any tulips this year. Did that make much of a difference um, to the business side of things for me? Um, or did I miss them so much that they're definitely coming back next year? And also just looking at different things to grow again. Are the same things going to be really good this year? The dahlias, the salvias, the status, they were my winners last year, but will it be different this year? What's our weather going to be like this year it's going to be really interesting to see what happens going forward so I hope you look forward to watching some videos along with me in the coming months as I get growing again it's likely going to be February that I start getting off the ground with the seed sowing and um, but I'm hoping to get a few videos out there showing you how to grow those individual flowers again so we started that series last year and we'll return to it this year as we get going and I'll show you a few other flowers that I haven't done yet if you've got any ideas about what you would like me to do videos on this year, then please do just mention them in the comments section because it's always really good to know what you want to know most about and it gives me some great ideas going forward. So please just jot any comments you've got in the section below at the end of the video and I'll get back to you and I'll take your ideas on board as well. So I'm super excited about growing in 2024 and I hope you are too. For me personally, it's exciting because it's my 10th year growing flowers and that feels like a really great milestone to have got to where local customers are still wanting locally grown flowers and local florists are wanting to use them, which is really good news. And also it's exciting for me because I think this year is going to be a new challenge. I've changed my life slightly. I am now working back in the hospital again a few days a week and I'm going to be combining that with flower growing and how do I get the balance of that right what what am I going to do what am I going to concentrate on most and how am I going to just manage growing the flowers in a shorter time scale can I be more efficient at growing my flowers so that the balance does work so I'm super excited about the challenge coming up and I'm looking forward to sharing lots with you as we go through 2024 growing season see you soon